Section 87 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brianna. The Golden Gems of Life by Emory Adams Allen and S. G. Ferguson. Section 87 sickness sickness takes us aside and sets us alone with god we are taken into his private chamber and there he converses with us face to face the world is afar off our relish for it is gone and we are alone with him Many are the words of grace and truth which he then speaks to us. All our former props are struck away, and now we must lean on God alone. The things of earth are felt to be vanity. Man's sympathy deserts us. We are cast wholly upon God that we may learn that his praise and his sympathy are enough. There is something in sickness that lowers the pride of manhood, that softens the heart and brings it back to the feelings of infancy. Who that has languished even in advanced life in sickness, but has thought of the mother who watched over his childhood, who smoothed his pillow and administered to his helplessness. When a man is laboring under the pain of any distemper, it is then that he recollects there is a God and that he himself is but a man. No mortal is then the object of his envy, his admiration or his contempt and having no malice to gratify the tales of slander excite him not but it unveils to him his own heart it shows him the need there is for sympathy and love between man and man thus disease opening our eyes to the realities of life is an indirect blessing one who has never known a day's illness is lacking in one department at least of moral culture he has lost the greatest lesson of his life he has missed the finest lecture in the great school of humanity the sick chamber disease generally begins that equality which thus completes the distinctions which set one man so much above another are very little perceived in the gloom of a sick chamber where it will be vain to expect entertainment from the gay or instruction from the wise where all human glory is obliterated the wit is clouded the reasoner perplexed and the hero subdued where the highest and the brightest of mortal beings finds nothing of real worth left him but the consciousness of innocence sickness brings a share of blessing with it what stores of human love and sympathy it reveals what constant affectionate care is ours what kindly greetings from friends and associates this very loosening of our hold upon life calls out such wealth of human sympathy that life seems richer than before then it teaches humility our absence is scarcely noticed from the noisy wrestling world we are separated completely yet our place is filled and all moves on without us so we learn that 
when at last we shall sink forever beneath the waves of the sea of life there will be but one ripple and the current will move steadily on it is on the bed of sickness that we fully realize the value of good health the first wealth is health sickness is poor spirited and cannot serve any one but health is one of the greatest blessings we are capable of enjoying money cannot buy it therefore value it and be thankful for it health is above all gold and treasure it enlarges the soul and opens all its powers to receive instruction and to relish virtue he that has health has but little more to wish for and he that has it not in the want of it wants everything it is beyond price since it is by health that money is procured thousands and even millions are small recompense for the loss of health poverty is indeed an evil from which we naturally fly but let us not run from one enemy to one still more implacable which is assuredly the lot of those who exchange poverty for sickness though accompanied by wealth in no situation and under no circumstances does human character appear to better advantage than when watching by the side of sickness the helplessness and weakness of the sick chamber makes a most effective appeal to the charity and natural kindness inherent in the hearts of all even of the most degraded thus it appears that sickness is not only of discipline to the sick one but it serves also to bring to a more perfect growth the flowers of charity and kindness in the hearts of those who care for the sick one it is on the sick bed that the heart learns most completely the value of self-examination life passes before the sick one as a gliding panorama how strong are the resolutions formed for future guidance and only god and the angels know how many lives have been turned from evil courses to the right have been snatched as brands from the burning who can date their progress in the good and true modes of living from some bed of sickness then let us be patient in sickness let us turn it to account in the bettering of our hearts and thus may we reap from seeing evil what will conduce in no small degree to our ultimate happiness end of section eight seven section number eighty eight of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sherry Lothridge The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S.C. Ferguson Section number 88 Sorrow Sorrows gather around great souls as storms do around great mountains, but like them they break the storms and purify the air. Those who have suffered much are like those who know many languages. They have learned to understand and be understood by all. Sorrows sober us and make the mind genial. In sorrows we love and trust our friends more tenderly, and the dead become dearer to us. Just as the stars shine out in the night, so there are faces that look at us in our grief, though 
before they were fading from our recollections. Suffering! Let no man dread it too much, because it is better for him, and will help make sure of being immortal, just as it is only at night that other worlds are to be seen shining in the distance, so it is in sorrow, the night of the soul, that we see the farthest and know ourselves natives of infinity, sons and daughters of immortality. The path of life meanders through a bright and beautiful world, a world where the fragrant flowers of friendship, nourished by the gentle dews of sympathy and the warmth of sunlight of affection, bloom in perennial beauty. But through this bright world there flows a stream whose turbid waters cross and recross the path of every pilgrim. It is the stream of human suffering. As the rose tree is composed of the sweetest flowers and the sharpest thorns, as the heavens are sometimes overcast, alternately tempestuous and serene, so is the life of man intermingled with the hopes and fears, with joy and sorrow, with pleasures and with pains. Life is beset with unavoidable annoyances, vexatious cares and harassing events, but we endure them, we strive to forget them, or like the dust-worn garment or the soil on our shoes we brush them off, and if possible scarcely bestow a thought on the trouble it requires. But when we have once been called upon to feel and undergo a great sorrow, to bend the back and bow the head, to endure the yoke and suffer the agony, to abide the pelting of the storm of adversity and sorrow, when few, perhaps none, sympathize with us. These are the days of anguish and of darkness, these the nights of desolation and despair, and when they endure as long as life shall last, and when they have once come upon us with their appalling weight, their remorseless power, we can never be beguiled into a forgetfulness of them. The memory of them endure as long as life shall last. We may again behold the beams of a cheerful sun throwing a delusive coloring over the landscape around us, but while our eyes may rest upon the lights, they will dwell upon the shadows of the picture. Time is the rider that breaks youth. To the young how bright the new world looks, how full of novelty, of enjoyment, of pleasure. But as years pass on, they are found to abound in sorrowful scenes as well as those pleasant. Scenes of toil, suffering, difficulty, perhaps misfortune and failure. Happy they who can pass through such trials with a firm mind and a pure heart, encountering trials with cheerfulness, and standing erect beneath even the heaviest burdens. Sorrow in the noblest of all discipline. Our nature shrinks from it, but it is not the less a discipline. It is a scourge, but there is healing in its stripes. It is a chalice, and the drought is bitter, but health proceeds from the bitterness. It is a crown of thorns, but it becomes a wreath of light on the brow which it has lacerated. It is a cross on which the spirit groans, but every calvary has an olivet. To every place of crucifixion there is likewise a place of ascension. The sun that is shrouded is unveiled, and the heavens open with hopes eternal to the soul which has nigh unto despair. Even in guilt sorrow has a sanctity within it. Place a bad man beside the deathbed or the grave, where all that he loved is cold. We are moved, we are one, by his affection, and we find the divine spark yet alive, which no vice could quench. Christianity itself is a religion of sorrow. It was born in sorrow, in sorrow it was tried, and by sorrow it was made perfect. The author of Christianity was a man of sorrow, and acquainted with grief. Sorrow is exalting and a baptism of sorrow is awarded to every one who strives for the higher life. Since Christ wept over Jerusalem, the best, the bravest, who have followed him in good will and good deeds have commenced their missions alike in suffering. Sorrow is not to be complained of. It is the passport by which we are to be made acceptable in that house where all tears shall be wiped away. It has power for good. It has joy within its gloom. And though Christianity is a religion of trials and suffering, it is not less a religion of hope. It casts down in order to exalt, and if it tries the spirit by affliction, it is to prepare it for a future great reward. 
all mankind must taste the cup which destiny has mixed be it bitter or be it sweet be not impatient under suffering it is for the correction of thy soul it is better to suffer than to injure it is better to suffer without a cause than that there should be cause for our suffering by experiencing distress an arrogant insensibility of temper is most effectually corrected endeavor to extract a blessing from the remembrance of thy own sufferings if so be that providence has so ordered your life that you are not subject to much of the discipline of sorrow strive to extract this discipline from the consideration of the lot of those less favored than you are step aside occasionally from the flowers and smooth path which is permitted you to walk in in order to view the toilsome march of your fellow creatures through the thorny desert the designed end of temporal affections is to cause men to consider their spiritual wants and to seek the good of their higher natures often suffering not only fails to purify the soul from sin but aggravates and intensifies its selfish and malignant passions this is always the case where the heart fails to accept the lesson taught by submission to sorrow the sweetest traits of character are developed as some fruits are brought to perfection only by frost misfortune should act upon us or upon our feelings like fire upon old tenements which are consumed only to be rebuilt with greater perfection the winds of adversity sweep over the soul and scatter the fairest blossoms of hope but the blossoms fall that the fruit may appear so with us when the flowers of hope are gone there come the fruits of long-suffering patience faith and love thus the darkest clouds which overhang human destiny may often appear the brightest to the angels who behold them with prophetic ken from heaven the damps of autumn sink into the leaves and prepare them for decay and thus are we insensibly perhaps detached from our hold on life by the gentle pressure of recorded sorrows who is not familiar with the fact that life which to the young promises so much but to the middle-aged presents a stern reality seems to the old as a day's labor now closing and even as the laborer worn by the burdens and heat of the day looks forward to rest so does the aged pilgrim oppressed by the accumulated griefs and sorrows of a lifetime look forward to the rest of death the first thing to be conquered in grief is the pleasure we feel in indulging in it persons may acquire a morbid and unhealthy state of feeling on this subject and by a constant giving way to feelings of grief become at last so constituted that on the slightest occasion they give way to apparently uncontrollable sorrow converting thus what was intended as a means of discipline necessary to soul growth into an evil which contracts life remember then that in the matter of giving expression to sorrow self-control is no less necessary than in the other affairs of life there is but one pardonable grief that for the departed this pleasing grief is but a variety of comfort the sighs are but a mournful mode of loving them there are sorrows too sacred to be babbled to the world griefs which one would forbear to whisper even to a friend real sorrow is not clamorous it seeks to shun every eye and breathes in solitude and silence the sighs that come from the heart every heart has also its secret sorrows of which the world knows nothing and oftentimes we call a man cold when he is only sorrowful sorrow may be divided into two classes that which really comes from the heart and is for the bettering of man and that which comes from wounded selfishness egotism and pride it is our duty to strive against giving vent to the latter kind of sorrow it is after all only selfish in feeling and expression it is the duty of all to cultivate cheerfulness of manner and disposition another has said give not thy mind to heaviness the gladness of heart is the life of man and the joyfulness of a man prolongeth his days remove sorrow far from thee for sorrow hath killed many and there is no profit therein and carefulness bringeth age before the time as limbs which are wrenched violently asunder do not bleed so the sudden shocks of overwhelming sorrow are unrelieved by tears the heart is benumbed the eyes are dry and the very fountain of feeling obstructed and stagnant 
our lighter afflictions find relief in lamentations and weeping and the voice of sympathy and compassion brings some consolation of peace but when the heart has been deeply and powerfully struck by some evil cruel blow of destiny the intensity of suffering exceeds the bounds of sensibility and emotion those who work hard seldom yield themselves entirely up to real or fancied sorrow when grief sits down folds its hands and mournfully feeds upon its own tears weaving the dim shadows that a little exertion might sweep away into oblivion the strong spirit is shorn of its might and sorrow becomes our master when sorrow then pours upon you instead of giving way to it rather seek by occupation to divert the dark waters that threaten to overwhelm you into the thousand channels which the duties of life always present before you dream of it those waters will fertilize the present and give birth to flowers that may brighten the future flowers that will become pure and holy in the sunshine which illuminates the path of duty in spite of every obstacle end of section eighty eight section eighty nine of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by laura langston the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section eighty nine poverty it cannot be too often repeated that it is not the so-called blessings of life its sunshine and calms that makes men but its rugged experiences its storms tempests and trials early poverty especially is emphatically a blessing in disguise the school of poverty graduates the ablest pupils it does more perhaps than anything else to develop the energetic self-reliant traits of character without which the highest ability makes but sorry work of life's battles thousands of men are bemoaning present indigence and obscurity who might have won riches and honor had they only been compelled by early poverty to develop their manhood as well expect the oak to grow strong in the atmosphere of the hothouse as that man would reach his best estate surrounded from earliest years by the comforts and luxury of wealth many of the evils of poverty are imaginary arising from mistaken notions we may entertain as to what constitutes happiness and comfort there is not such a difference as some men imagine between the poor and the rich in pomp show and opinion there is a great deal but little as to the real pleasures and joys of life no man is poor who does not think himself so but if in a full fortune with impatience he desires more he proclaims his wants and his beggarly condition we are more and more impressed that the poor are only they who feel poor he whom we esteem wealthy in a true scale would perhaps be found very indigent of what avail the wealth of croesus if the heart feels pinched and poor it is one of the mysteries of our life that genius the noblest gift of god to man is nourished by poverty its noblest works have been achieved by the sorrowing ones of the world in tears and despair not in the brilliant saloon furnished with every comfort and elegance not in the library well fitted softly carpeted and looking out upon a smooth green lawn or a broad expanse of scenery not in ease and competence is genius born and nurtured more frequently in adversity and destitution amidst the harassing cares of a straitened household in bare and fireless garrets is genius born and reared this is its birthplace and with such surroundings have men labored studied and trained themselves until they have at last emanated out of the gloom of that obscurity the shining lights of their time and exercised an influence upon the thoughts of the world amounting to a species of intellectual legislation if there is anything in the world that a young man should be more grateful for than another it is the poverty which necessitates his starting in life under very great disadvantages poverty is one of the best tests of human quality in existence a triumph over it is like graduating with honor from west point it demonstrates stuff and stamina it is a certificate of worthy labor faithfully performed a young man who cannot stand this test is not good for anything 
he can never rise above a drudge or a pauper. If he cannot feel his will harden as the yoke of poverty presses upon him, and his pluck rise with every difficulty that poverty throws in his way, he may as well withdraw from the conflict, since his defeat is already assured. Poverty saves a thousand times more men than it ruins, for it only ruins those who are not worth saving, while it saves multitudes of those whom wealth would have ruined. It is of decided advantage for a man to be under the necessity of having to struggle with poverty and conquer it. He who has battled, says Carlyle, were it only with poverty and toil, will be found stronger and more expert than he who could stay at home from the battle. It is not prosperity so much as adversity, not wealth so much as poverty, that stimulates the perseverance of strong and healthy natures, rouses their energy, and develops their character. Indeed, misfortune and poverty have frequently converted the indolent votary of society into a useful member of the community, and made him a moving power in the great workshop of the world, teaching men and developing the powers which nature has bestowed on them. Poverty is the great test of civility and the touchstone of friendship. Amid the poverty and privation of the humblest homes are often found scenes of magnanimity and self-denial as utterly beyond the belief as it is the practices of the great and rich. Acts of self-denial, kindness, and generosity, which borrow no support either from the gaze of the many or the admiration of the few, yet giving daily exhibitions of its strength and constancy. It is the great privilege of poverty to be happy and unenvied, to be healthy without physic, secure without a guard, and to obtain from the bounty of nature what the great and wealthy are compelled to procure by the help of art. Few are the real wants and necessities of mankind. Some men, with thousands a year, suffer more for want of means than others with only hundreds. The reason is found in the artificial wants of the former. Though his income is great, his wants are still greater, and, as a consequence, his income is not equal to his outgo. There are many wealthy people who, of course, enjoy their wealth, but there are thousands who never know a moment's peace because they live above their means. He who earns but a dollar a day and does not run in debt is a happier man. The great secret of being solvent and well-to-do and comfortable is to get ahead of your expenses. Eat and drink this month what you earned last month, not what you are going to earn the next. Poverty may be a bitter draught, yet it is often a tonic, strengthening all the powers of manhood. Though the drinker makes a wry face, there is, after all, a wholesome goodness in the cup. But debt, however courteously it may be offered, is the cup of a siren, and the wine, spiced and delicious though it may be, is poison. The man out of debt, though with a flaw in his jerkin and a hole in his hat, is still the son of liberty, free as the singing bird above him. But the debtor, although clothed in the utmost bravery, what is he but a serf out upon a holiday, a slave to be reclaimed at every instant by his owner, the creditor? Poverty is never felt so severely as by those who have seen better days. The poverty of the poor has many elements of hardness, but it is endurable and is developing their strength and endurance. The poverty of the formerly affluent is indeed hard. It avoids the light of day and shuns the sympathy of those who would relieve its wants. It preys upon the heart and corrodes the mind. The sunshine of life is gone and it requires a strong mind to resolutely set about to mend the impaired fortune. It is the misfortune of many young persons today that they begin life with too many advantages. Every possible want of their many-sided nature is supplied before it is consciously felt. Books, teachers, mental and religious training, lectures, amusements, clothes and food, all of the best quality and without stint in quantity, in short, the pick of the world's good things, and help of every kind are lavished upon them, till satiety results and all ambition is extinguished. What motive has a young man for whom life is thus thrice winnowed to exert himself? Having supped full of life's sweets, he finds them palling on his taste. Having done nothing to earn its good things, he cannot appreciate their value. Like a hothouse plant, grown weak and spindling through too much shelter and watching, he needs nothing so much as to be set in the open air of the world and to grow strong with struggling for existence. 
it is a fact that the working successful men of to-day were once industrious self-reliant boys and the same thing will be repeated for from the ranks of the hard-working economical temperate and self-reliant boys of to-day will emanate the progressive prominent men of the future all boys should grow up strong as steel bars fighting their way to an education and then when they are all ready plunging into real life the majority of the men of mark in this country are not the sons of those whose fathers could give them all they want and much more than they should have but are those who were brought up in cottages and cabins cutting their way through difficulties on every side to their present commanding position of all poverty that of the mind is the most deplorable and it is at the same time without excuse every one who wills it can lay in a rich store of mental wealth the poor man's purse may be empty but he has as much gold in the sunset and as much silver in the moon as anybody wealth of heart is not dependent upon wealth of purse home comfort and happiness does not depend upon elegance of surroundings but it is found in the spirit presiding over the household this is the spirit of loving kindness and is as apt to dwell with poverty as with wealth thus the evils of poverty are much exaggerated and the evils if evils they be are after all for our own ultimate good end of section eighty nine recording by laura langston section ninety of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson affliction there is an elasticity to the human mind capable of bearing much but which will not show itself until a certain weight of affliction be put upon it fear not the darkness saith the persian proverb it conceals perhaps the springs of the water of life experience is often bitter but wholesome only by its teachings can we learn to suffer and be strong character in its highest forms is disciplined by trial and made perfect through suffering even from the deepest sorrow the patient and thoughtful mind will gather a richer meed than pleasure ever yielded bereavement think it not unkind when afflictions befall thee it is all for the best that they are sent god calls those whom he loveth and why should he not claim his own jewels to shine in his house though our own be made dreary it may seem hard under such circumstances to say that it is all for the best the human heart is prone to give over to grief and lamentations but wait soon when like the tired pilgrim thou shalt fall sick and weary he will take you home to rejoice in finding friends from whom you have been separated then how true will be the saying that it was all for the best sad accidents and a state of affliction are a school of virtue it reduces our spirits to soberness and our counsels to moderation it corrects levity god who governs the world in mercy and wisdom never would have suffered the virtuous ones to endure so many keen afflictions did he not intend that they should be the seminary of comfort the nursery of virtue the exercise of wisdom and the trial of patience the venturing for a crown and the gate of glory much of the most useful work done by men and women has been done amidst afflictions sometimes as a relief from it sometimes as a sense of duty overpowering personal sorrow adversity is the touchstone of character as some herbs need to be crushed 
to give forth their sweetest odors so some natures need to be tried by suffering to evoke the excellence that is in them grief is a common bond that unites hearts it can knit hearts closer than happiness can and common sufferings are far stronger links than common joys the visitations of sorrow are universal there beats not a heart but that it has felt the force of affliction there is not an eye but has witnessed many scenes of sorrow they are always impaired by sorrow who are not thereby improved some natures are like grapes the more they are downtrodden the richer tribute they supply it may be affirmed substantially that good men reap more real benefit from their affliction than bad men do from their prosperities for what they lose in wealth pleasure or honor they gain in wisdom and tranquillity of mind no creature would be more unhappy said demetrius than a man who had never known affliction the best need afflictions for the trial of their virtue how can we exercise the grace of contentment if all things succeed well or that of forgiveness if we have no enemies at a superficial view it appears that adversity happens to all alike without regard to rank or condition the good are apparently as little favored by fortune in this respect as the bad the high as the humble people are continually rising and falling in all the grades of society we often see men of high expectations suddenly cut down and left to struggle with despair and ruin if the happiness of mankind depended upon the caprice of fortune their condition would be wretched but it is possible to possess a mind which will not lose its tranquillity in the severest adversity or at least such a one as being disturbed and deprived of its wonted serenity by a sudden calamity will recover in a short period and assume its native buoyancy by the shock which it has experienced how uncertain is human life there is but a breath of air and a beat of a heart betwixt this world and the next in the brief interval of painful and awful suspense while we feel that death is present with us we are powerless and he all-powerful the last faint pulsation here is but the prelude of endless joys hereafter in the midst of the stunning calamity about to befall us when death is in the family circle and some loved one is about to be taken from us we feel as if earth had no compensating good to mitigate the severity of our loss but we forget that there is no grief without some beneficent provisions to soften its intensities thus in the presence of death there is also a consolation has the life been stormy there is now rest rest for the troubled heart and the weary head and it can be known only by experience with what a longing many hearts thus look forward to the rest of death many whom the world regards as peculiarly blessed by providence carrying with them such corroding anxious cares that it is with a feeling of relief that they contemplate the approach of death to them death comes in its most beautiful form he borrows the garb of gentle sleep lays down his iron sceptre and his cold hand falls as warm as the hand of friendship over the weary heart now ceasing to beat grief or misfortune seems to be indispensable to the development of intelligence energy and virtue the trials to which humanity are subject are necessary to draw them from their lethargy to disclose their character 
afflictions even have the effect of eliciting talents which in prosperous circumstances would have lain dormant suffering indeed seems to have been as divinely appointed as joy while it is much more influential as a discipline of character suffering may be the appointed means by which the highest nature of man is to be disciplined and developed sometimes a heartbreak rouses an impassive nature to life what does he know said a sage who has not suffered no soul is so obscure that god does not take thought for its schooling the sun is the central light of the solar system but it has a mission to the ripening corn and the purpling clusters on the vine as well as the ponderous planet the sunshine that comes filtering through the morning mists with healing on its wings and charming all the birds to singing should have also a message from god to sad hearts no soul is so grief-laden that it may not be lifted to sources of heavenly comfort by recognizing the divine love in the perpetual recurrence of earthly blessings afflictions sent by providence must be submitted to in a humble spirit otherwise they will not conduce to lasting good the same furnace that hardens clay liquefies gold and the manifestation of divine power pharaoh found his punishment but david his pardon as the musician straineth at his strings and yet breaketh none of them but maketh thereby a sweeter melody a better concord so god through affliction makes his own better unto the fruition and enjoyment of the life to come. Afflictions are the medicine of the mind. If they are not toothsome, let it suffice that they are wholesome. It is not required in physic that it should please, but that it should heal. Let one of our loved ones be taken away, and memory recalls a thousand sayings to regret death quickens recollection painfully the grave cannot hide the white face of the one who sleeps the coffin and the green mound are cruel magnets they draw us further than we would go they force us to remember a man never sees so far into human life as when he looks over a wife's or a mother's grave his eyes get wondrous clear then, and he sees as never before what it is to love and be loved, what it is to injure the feelings of the beloved. When death comes into a household, we do not philosophize, we only feel. The eyes that are full of tears do not see though in the course of time they come to see more clearly and brightly than those that have never known sorrow. Perhaps the heaviest affliction of life is that of the mother who lost a child. As the waters roll in on shore with incessant throbs, not alone when storms prevail, but in calms as well, so it is with a mother's heart bereaved of her children. Death always speaks with a voice of instruction and reproof. But when the first death happens in a home, it speaks with a voice which scarcely any other form of tribulation can equal. Some of the saddest experiences of life come without premonition. Yesterday, life went well. Hope was in the ascendant. It was easy to be content. Today all is reversed. The crushed heart can scarcely lift itself to pray. Speech seems paralyzed. It seems cruel that such calamity should be permitted, when we might have been so happy. Was there not some way by which it could have been avoided? What are life's compensations now? What are its ambitions worth in the face of this? In a great affliction, there is no light, either in the mind or in the sun, for when the inward light is fed with fragrant oil, there can be no darkness. 
though clouds should cover the sun but when like a sacred lamp in the temple the inward light is quenched there is no light outwardly though a thousand suns should preside in the heavens why should body and soul be plunged into sorrow's dungeon when god sees fit to afflict is not the world as bright as of yore are there not still some happy phases to life's weary pilgrimage we should not complain of oppression but with submission and love perform the duties of life and though sorrow and grief come we must not let darkness obscure the talents which god has given to promote our own and others happiness or bury them with the brighter past but nobly use them and count all sorrow as naught in comparison with the future great reward of right actions after this life of sorrow and pain where we are continually weighted down with care there is a home of perpetual rest the streets of which are thronged with an angelic host who with songs on their lips and with harps in their hands tell neither the sorrow nor grief which perhaps wasted their lives to bear the ills of life patiently is one of the noblest virtues and one that requires as vigorous an exercise of the will as to resent the encroachments of wrong End of section 90. Section 91 of the Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 91 Disappointments. It is sometimes of God's mercy that men in the eager pursuit of ambitious plans are baffled, for they are very like a train on down grade. Pulling on the brake is not pleasant, but it keeps the car on the track. We mount to heaven mostly on the ruins of our cherished schemes, finding in our failures our real successes. Disappointments seem to be the lot of man, from the little child with golden hair attempting to catch the glancing sunbeams, to the old man who, with whitened locks and bent frame, pursues some scheme of wealth. Disappointment is the almost inevitable consequence well it is for us that the future is veiled from our eyes else we would weary of the trials and allurements that make up the sum of our existence the child looks forward to manhood his dreams are speculative the man looks back to childhood and thinks of the happy days of old from the time he sits on his mother's knee with the sunlight streaming in through the open window until the last hours of life when the sunlight glances in through closed shutters he is playing with shadows and one of the saddest thoughts that come to us in life is the thought that in this bright beautiful joy living world of ours there are so many shadowed lives if disappointment came only to the lot of the sinning even then we might drop a tear over him whose errors wrought their own recompense but it is not so the most pure lives are sometimes those that are the fullest of disappointments with one it is the wreck of a great ambition he has builded his ship and launched it on the sea of life freighted with the richest jewels of his strength and manhood behold it comes back to him beaten battered and torn by the fury of the gale the wreck of a first trial many are disappointed because they do not look for happiness and success either in the right spirit or by the proper methods there is a legend told of a knight who in the brave days of old 
journeyed far away in search of the holy grail he engaged in great pursuits he sought the most arduous undertakings but failing to seek in the right spirit his search and his efforts were in vain at length wearied and disappointed he sought his native land here in the work of daily trifling duties humbly seeking to do what was right he unexpectedly found that for which he had so long searched in life we all seek happiness and success there is but one way in which we can succeed when we admit that happiness is but a state of the mind and that success is the faithful performance of no duties then shall we acquire both though we may wander the wide world over and gather wealth and fame they will be found impotent to confer happiness and life to us will seem full of disappointments but it is so simply because we fail to seek for life in that spirit of quiet content which alone conducts us to its portals it never yet happened to any man since the beginning of the world nor ever will to have all things according to his desires and there never was any one yet to whom fortune was not at some time opposite and adverse those who risk nothing can of course lose nothing sowing no hopes they can not suffer from the blight of disappointment but let him who is enlisted for the war expect to meet the foe it is with life's troubles as with the risks of the battlefield there is always less of aggregate danger to the party who stands firm than to the one who gives way to give way to disappointments is to invite defeat to bravely cast about for means to resist them is to put them to fight and out of temporary misfortune to lay the foundation of a more glorious success send disappointments to the winds take life as it is and with a strong will make it as near what it should be as possible dark and full of disappointments may be our lot and we may not be able to fathom the reason for them but if we can only bring ourselves to see that they are for our good that we need their chastening influence all will be well in the end in the trials of life we must look more for consolation within than from without the surest consolations of life are those which we thus derive from our own thoughts for this end matters not so much whether we spend time in study or toil the thoughts of the mind should go out and reach after higher good in this manner we may improve ourselves till our thoughts come to be the sweet companions that shall lead us along the paths of virtue thus we may grow better within whilst the cares of life the losses and the disappointments lose their sharp thorns and the journey of life be made comparatively pleasant and happy it is generally known that he who expects much will be often disappointed yet disappointment seldom cures us of expectations it is human to err so it is the lot of morals to be disappointed for never yet did error secure the end wished it is however the better philosophy to take things calmly and endeavor to be content with our lot we may at least add some rays of sunshine to our path if we earnestly endeavor to dispel the clouds of discontent that may arise in our bosom and by so doing enjoy more fully the bountiful blessing that god gives to his humblest creatures the great secret of avoiding disappointment is not to expect too much despair follows immoderate hopes as the higher a body rises the heavier it falls to the ground time is the great consoler of the world 
inasmuch as he hails our sorrows and trials but time in dashing to pieces our most cherished plans and brightest dreams also brings us to many disappointments which in turn disappear with the passage of years while sagacity contrives patience matures and labor industriously executes disappointment laughs at the curious fabric formed by so many efforts and gay with so many brilliant colors and when the artist imagines the work arrived at the moment of completion brushes away the beautiful fabric and leaves nothing behind we thus see that life is indeed a variegated scene full of trials and full of joys bright dreams some fulfilled more disappointed what is the lesson for us to learn from this perhaps the truest philosophy is not to expect much to be moderate in our plans and hopes in youth especially are we apt to be over sanguine reflect that life is full of disappointments that it is vain for you to expect to escape them but also learn to go forward with a brave face you may fail but from this failure you can organize future success because disappointment in one particular plan it is no reason why you should abandon all plans and settle down to the conviction that life itself is a failure show yourself a man and rise superior to misfortune and you will be rewarded by a final victory made more glorious by temporary discouragement just as the sun bursting from behind the clouds lights up the landscape with a more glorious light because of the storms of the morning End of section 91. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section 92 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Visal. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S.C. Ferguson Section 92 Failure It is a mistake to suppose that men succeed through success. They much oftener succeed through failure. By far the best experience of men, experience from which they gain the most of lasting value, is gathered from their failures in their dealings with others in the affairs of life such failures for sensible men incite to better self-management and greater tact and self-control as a means of avoiding them in the future ask the successful businessman and he'll tell you that he learned the secret of success through being baffled defeated thwarted and circumvented far more than from his successes precept study advice and example could never have taught them so well as failure has done it has disciplined and taught them what to do as well as what not to do and this latter is often of more importance than the former many have to make up their minds to encounter failure again and again before they finally succeed but if they have pluck the failure will only serve to rouse their energies and stimulate them to renewed efforts failure in one direction has sometimes had the effect of forcing the far-seeing student to apply himself in another which latter application has in many instances proven to be in just the line that they were fitted for no one can tell how many of the world's most brilliant geniuses have succeeded because of their first failures failures in many instances are only means that providence takes to work an otherwise too pliable disposition into one fitted to confront the stern duties of life even as steel is tempered by heat and through much hammering and changing of original form is at last wrought into useful articles so in the history of many men do we find that they were tempered in the furnace of trials and affliction and only through failures in first attempts were at length fitted for the ultimate success that crowned their efforts they are doubly in error who suffer themselves to give up the battle at one 
or even two successive failures. As in the military field, he is the greater general who from defeat organizes ultimate victory. So in the battle of life, he is the true hero who, even while smarting under the sting of present failure, lays his plans and summons his forces for a triumphant victory. We must not allow our jaundiced views to prevail over our knowledge of men and affairs. The world is not coming to an end, nor society going to destruction, because our petty plans have miscarried. The present failure should only teach you to be more wary in the future, and thus will you gather a rich harvest as the final outcome of your efforts. Above all, do not sink into apathy and despair. Arouse yourself and do not allow your best years to slip past, because you have not succeeded as you thought you would. Is not the sun as bright, nature as smiling as before? Why then do you go about as if all hope had fled? Know you not that in the reproof of chance lies the true proof of men? As in the physical world, disease is but the effort nature makes to remove some pressing evil, so failure should be but the methods whereby we are enabled to eliminate those traits of character which are a hindrance to our lasting success. As the inventor subjects his production to the most rigorous tests in order that inherent defects may become known and, if possible, remedied, even so does providence in subjecting us to great trials, discover to us by our failures wherein we lack. And we are remiss in duty to ourselves, do we not most earnestly endeavour to improve by these tests? The man who never failed is a myth, such a one never lived and is never likely to. All success is a series of efforts in which, when closely viewed, are to be seen more or less failures. These efforts are oft times not visible to the naked eye, but each individual heart is painfully conscious of how many of its most cherished plans ended only in failures. If you fail now and then, do not be discouraged. Bear in mind that it's only the part and experience of every successful man. We might even go farther and say that the most successful men often have the most failures. These failures which, to the feeble, are mere stumbling blocks to the strong serve to remove the scales from their eyes, so that they now see clearer and go on their way with a firmer tread and a more determined mien and compel life to yield to them its most enduring trophies. The weak link goes no farther than his first failure. He lags behind and subsides into a life of discontent and vain regrets. And so, by this winnowing process, the number of the athletes is restricted to few, and there is clear space in the arena for those who determinedly press on. There can hardly be found a successful man who will not admit that he was made so by failure, and that what he once thought his hard fate was in reality his good fortune. Success cannot be gained by a hop, skip and a jump, but by arduous passages of gallant perseverance, toilsome efforts, long sustained and most of all by repeated failure. For the failures are but stepping stones, or, at the worst, non-attainment of the desired end before the time. If success were to crown your efforts now, where would be the great success of the future? It is the brave resolution to do better next time that lays the substrata of all real greatness. Many a prominent reputation has been destroyed by early success. Too often the effect of such success is to sap the energies. Imagining fame or fortune to be won, future efforts are remitted. Relying on the fame of past achievements, the fact is overlooked that it is labour alone that renders any success certain. And so, by the remission of labour and energy, disgrace or failure awakens him from his delusive dreams, but alas, in how many instances the awakening comes too late. There is no more prolific source of repining and discontent in life than that found in looking back upon past mistakes. We are fond of persuading ourselves and others that had others acted differently, our whole course in life would have been one of unmixed success instead of the partial failure that it so often appears. If we would only look on the past mistakes in the right spirit, in the spirit of humility and with a desire to learn from past errors, it would be well, 
but the error men make in this review is in attributing the failures to circumstances instead of to character. They see the mistakes which lie on the surface, but fail to trace them back to the source from whence they spring. The truth is that even trifling circumstances are occasions for bringing out the predominant traits of character. They are tests of the nature and quality of the man rather than the causes of future success or failure. None can tell how weighty may be the results of even trivial actions, nor how much of the future is bound up in our everyday decisions. Chances are lost, opportunities wasted, advisers ill-chosen and disastrous speculations undertaken. But there is nothing properly accidental in these steps. They are to be regarded as the results of unbalanced characters as much as the cause of future misery. The disposition of mind that led to these errors would certainly under other circumstances have led to different but not less lamentable results. We see clearly in judging others we attribute their mischances without compunction to the faults we see in them and sometimes even make cruel mistakes in our investigation. But in reviewing our own course Self draws a veil over our imperfections, and we persuade ourselves that mistakes or unfortunate circumstances are the entire cause of all our misfortunes. It is true that no circumstances are always favorable, no training perfectly judicious, no friend wholly wise, yet he who is always shifting the blame to his failures upon these external causes is the very man who has the most reason to trace them to his own inherent weakness or demerits. It is questionable whether the habit of looking much at mistakes, even of our own, is a very profitable one. It might be rendered of use were we only to do so in the proper spirit. Certainly the practice of mourning over and bewailing them, and charging upon them all the evils that afflict us, is the most injurious to our future course, and the greatest hindrance to any real improvement of character. Acting from impulse and not from reason, is one of the chief causes of these mistakes, and if any will avoid them in the future, they must test all their sudden impulses by the searching and penetrating ordeal of their best judgment before acting upon them. Above all, the steady formation of virtuous habits, the subjection of all actions to principles rather than to policy, the firm and unyielding adherence to duty, as far as it is known, are the best safeguards against mistakes in life. Who lives that has not, during his life, aspired to something that he was unable to reach? The sorrows of mankind may all be traced to blighted hopes. Like frost upon the green leaves comes the chilling conviction that our hopes are forever dead. We may live, but he who has placed his whole mind on the attainment of some object and fails to reach it, life to him seems a burden, a weary burden. To youth, blighted hopes come like the cold dew of the evening upon the flowers. The sun next morning banishes the dew, and the flower is brighter and purer from its momentary affliction. Sorrow purifies the heart of youth as the rain purifies the growing plant. But to the man of mature years, the blighting of cherished hopes falls with a chilling effect. It is hard to proceed as though nothing had happened. To cheerfully take up life's load, yet such is the course of true manhood, this is the inheritance of life, the test of character. Our world presents a strangely different aspect according to the different moods in which it is viewed. To him whose efforts have been crowned with success, it is superlatively beautiful. To him whose life has known no care, it appears to be filled with all manner of comfortable things. To those who pine in sickness and suffering, the unfortunate and those whose efforts have ended only in failure, it most truthfully seems to be a wail of tears, and human life itself a bubble raised from those tears and inflated with sighs, which, after floating a little while, decked it may be with a few gaudy colours from the hand of fortune, is at last touched by the hand of death and dissolves. He who has a stout heart will do stout-hearted actions, actions which, however unconscious the doer may be of the fact, cannot fail to have something of immortality in their essence, something that in all coming time will preserve alive their memory long after the valiant doer has lain in dust. Such a man will not be daunted by difficulties. 
Opposition will but serve as fuel to the fire which feeds the spirit of self-reliance within him, stimulating him to still greater efforts and in fact creating opportunities for them. And though in the nature of things failure must often be his portion, still they'll nerve him anew for the struggles of active life and endow him with courage to meet the further disappointments which past experience will have taught him are likely to be his lot. Neither will he, in his efforts to attain some great end, to bring to happy accomplishment some noble work, be daunted by the reflection that he can never be sure of success even in enterprises springing from the highest motives and steadfastly pursued at the cost of all that is dearest. To him it will suffice that the end he has in view is the right one, and that if he is not destined to accomplish it, eventually it must triumph. With prophetic eye he looks forward to the dawning of the time, when long after he has been called hence, posterity shall enter into his labour and eat of the fruit of the tree that he has planted. End of section 92 Section 93 of Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Victoria Wilson. The Golden Gems of Life by Emery Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 93. Despondency. Quote, the darkest day, live till tomorrow, will have passed away. End quote. They are dark hours that mark the history of the brightest years, for not a whole month in any one of a thousand of the past, perhaps, has the sun shone brightly all the time, and there have been cold and stormy days in every year, and yet the mists and shadows of the darkest hours were dissipated and flitted heedlessly away. In a wide world also we have the overshadowing of dark hours. There have been hours of despondency when Shakespeare thought himself no poet, and Raphael no painter when the greatest wits doubted the excellence of her happiest efforts. But we also have bright days to offset the sad ones, though there are the dark ones, when the fire will neither burn in our hearths nor our hearts, and all without and within is dismal and dark. There come days when we rejoice in the brightness of hope and prosperity. It is human nature to look upon only the bright and cheery scenes of life, to forget its trials and storms and light of a present. But let us not forget that there will come other moments, and the eye will be less calm, the cheek less bright, and the tongue less silent. The brain will be full of imaginings, pensive and sad, its inmost springs less elastic and buoyant. Despondency too long continued gives place to despair. No calamity can produce such a paralysis of a mind. It is the capstone of the climax of human misery. The mental powers are frozen with indifference. The heart becomes ossified of melancholy. The soul is shrouded in a cloud of gloom. No words of consolation, no cheerful repartee, can break the death-like calm. No love can warm the pent-up heart, no sunbeam dispel the dark cloud. Time may effect a change. Death will break the monotony. We could extend our kindness, but we cannot relieve a victim. We may trace the cause of this awful disease. God only can effect a cure. We may speculate upon its nature. We cannot feel its force until its iron hand is laid upon us. We may call it weakness but cannot prove or demonstrate the proposition. We may call it folly, but can point to no frivolity to sustain our position. We may call it madness, but can discover no manic action. We may call it stubbornness, but can see no exhibition of indocility. We may call it lunacy, but cannot perceive the incoherence of that unfortunate condition. We can properly call it nothing but dark, gloomy despair, an inexpressible numbness of all the sensibilities rendering a man happy. It is indeed... A happy providence that has given to mankind a bright, shining sun of hope to dispel the gloom of despondency. We have all seen the sun burst from behind the clouds and light up a storm-swept landscape. Even so, when the hand of misfortune has darkened our brightest prospects and swept away our sunlit dreams of future happiness, has some unseen monitor inspired our drooping spirit with hope and bid us struggle on, and as we look forward into the future, fancy points us to a brighter day dawning when the soul is often bowed down with the weight of its own sorrows, and a heart is well nigh crushed. Even some faint glimmering of a happier future steals upon it like a rainbow of light. It is to be feared that many do not as resolutely fight against fits of despondency as they might, 
Many fits of the blues need to be but resolutely contended against, and they will disappear. Harbored, they will grow into despondency and despair. It is worthwhile to remember that fortune is like the skies in April, sometimes clouded and sometimes clear and favorable, and it would be folly to despair of again seeing the sun because the day is stormy. So it is equally unwise to sink into despondency when fortune frowns, since in the common course of things she may be surely expected to smile again. Life is a warfare, and he who easily desponds deserts a double duty. He betrays the noblest property of man, his dauntless resolution, and he rejects the providence of God, who guides and rules the universe. There is but one way to look at fate, whatever that may be, whether blessings or afflictions, to behave with dignity under both. We must not lose heart, or it will be the worse, both for ourselves and for those whom we love, to struggle, and again and again to renew the conflict. This is life's inheritance. Do not, then, allow yourself to sink into despondency. Man is born a hero, and it is only by darkness and storms that heroism gains its greatest and best development in illustrations. Then it kindles the black cloud into a blaze of glory, and the storm bears it to its destiny. Spare not, then. Mortifying failures may attend this effort and that one, but only be honest and struggle on, and it will all work out right in the end. Do not make the mistake, either, of supposing that despondency is a state of humility. On the contrary, it is the vexation and despair of a cowardly pride. Nothing is worse. Whether we stumble or whether we fall, we must only think of rising again and going on in our course. Do your work, then. Only let it be a noble one. Be faithful to your trust. If you have but one talent, improve it. Do not bury it in the earth because you have not ten. Toil steadily and hopefully on, for life is too short to admit of delay or despondency. Let those who are in sorrow remember that deliverance may be coming, may they see it not. Your days may wear more gold in the morning, and more at night, though a midday may be full of snow. God may be gracious, though he comes to us robed in darkness and clothed in storms. It is the journey of release toward spring, when winter is coldest and darkest. Despondency is but the shadow of too much happiness thrown by our spirits upon the sunshiny side of life. Look up, and God will give you a song in your heart instead of a tear in your eye. Causeless depression of spirits is not to be reasoned with, nor can even David's harp charm its way by sweet discoursings. As well fight with the mists as with the shapeless, undefinable, and yet all beclouding hopelessness, Yet we are familiar with many such instances in practical, everyday life. Many who have much to be thankful for are full of complaint. Such disposition is no less unfortunate than it is reprehensible. They make miserable not only their own life, but also the lives of those with whom they are in daily contact. No doubt the one given over to causeless melancholy feels a full weight of sorrow, and those who laugh at his grief, could they but experience it, would quickly be sobered into compassion. What is wanted is a firm reliance on providence, and a determination to do your duty, then go forward bravely and cheerfully, resolutely fight against this disposition. Your life will be much happier. The trouble is that many of us, when we are under any affliction, are troubled with a certain malicious melancholy. We only dwell and pour upon the sad and dark occurrences of providence, but never take notice of the more benign and bright ones. Our way in this world is, like a walk under a row of trees, checkered with light and shade, and, because we cannot all along walk in the sunshine, we, therefore, perversely fix upon the darker passages, and so lose all comfort of the cheering ones. We are like throward children who, if you take one of their playthings from them, throw away all the rest in spite. What a pitiable confession is this of human weakness! Let us, then, strive against such a spirit of despondency, even when the way before us is both dark and drear. It is worse than useless to give way to despondency. Think not that you are forsaken. You have much still to make life enjoyable. Energy and proper application may recover what you have lost. Take heart. Pluck up courage. Give not over to despondency. By resolutely confronting the evils of life, they will lose their force. End of section 93. Despondency. Recording by Victoria Wilson. This recording is in the public domain. Section 94 of The Golden Gems of Life. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. 
The Golden Gems of Life by Emory Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 94. Faith. Faith is the subtle chain that binds us to the infinite, the voice of a deep life within that will remain until we crowd it thence. Faith is the true prophet of the soul, and ever beholds spiritual life, spiritual relations, labors, and joys. Its office is to teach man that he is a spiritual being, that he has an inward life enshrined in this material encasement, an immortal gem set now in an earthly casket. It assures man that he lives not for this life alone, but for another superior to this, more glorious and real. It teaches that God is a spirit, and seeks to worship him as such. It dignifies humanity with immortality. It dwells ever upon an unseen world, announcing always that unseen realities are eternal. A living, active faith is not only a necessity, if we would reap great good, but it is so founded on the nature of things that it is natural for men to have a faith in the promises of others. It is only from experience that the little child learns to distrust others. Then there is the faith in one's own powers. This is as necessary a form of faith as any, and where not allowed to degenerate into egotism is a most beneficent form of faith. Its true foundation is the same as any faith, that is, reliance on God's promises. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. Hence, relying on this and putting forth the necessary exertions, why not confidently expect a fulfillment of the promise? This is the germ of all true self-confidence. A true faith we can somehow reach all through life, and it will bring to the soul a rich meed of consolation even in the shades of life. We can cherish a sure hope about our future and the future of those that belong to us, a sunny, eager onlooking toward the fulfillment of all the promises God has written on our nature. We should have faith in the ultimate triumph of the good and the true. It is quite the fashion of the times to lament over the degeneracy of the present and to think of the palmy day long since past. We have indeed read history to but little account do we not realize that the world is growing better and feel confident of the ultimate triumph of the forces of good. Life grows darker as we go on, till only one pure light is left shining on it, and that is faith. Old age, like solitude and sorrow, has its revelations. It is then that we perceive the hollowness and emptiness of many of the bubbles we have been pursuing. Fortunate is he who in that hour can rest down on the promise of God with a steadfast faith. When in your last hour all faculty in your broken spirit shall fade away and sink into inanity, imagination, thought, effort, enjoyment all fade away. Then will the flower of belief which blossoms even in the night remain to refresh you with its fragrance in the last darkness. Morality as a guiding light to man sometimes conduces to noble ends. It is sometimes so resplendent as to make a man walk through life amid glory and acclamation. But it is apt to burn very dimly and low when carried into the valley of the shadow of death. But faith is like the evening star shining into our souls. The more gloomy is the night of death in which they sink. Surrounded by friends and the comforts of life, morality appears sufficient. But when the storms of life blow upon us, when we see how necessary to us is a faith in God's word and his promises, its light only is capable of dispelling the gloom of our surroundings. Never yet did there exist a full faith which did not expand the intellect while it purified the heart, which did not multiply the aims and objects of the understanding while it fixed and simplified those of the desires and passions. Faith often builds in the dungeon and laser house its sublimest shrine, and up through roofs of stone that shut out the eye of heaven ascend the ladder of prayer, where the angels glide to and fro. Faith is the key that unlocks the cabinet of God's treasures, the messenger from the celestial world to bring all the supplies that we need. It converses with angels and antedates the hymns of glory. 
to every man this grace is certain that there are glories for him if he walks by faith and perseveres in duty faith is a homely private capital as there are public savings banks and poor funds out of which in times of need we can relieve the necessities of individuals so here the faithful take their coin in peace a christian builds his fortitude on a better foundation than stoicism he is pleased with everything that happens because he knows it could not have happened unless it first pleased god and that which pleases him must be the best he is assured that no new thing can befall him and that he is in the hands of the father who will prove him with no affliction that resignation cannot conquer or that death cannot cure in the darkest night faith sees a star in the times of greatest need finds a helping hand and in the times of sorest trouble hears a sympathizing voice judge not a man by his outward manifestation of faith for some there are who trembling reach out shaking hands to the guidance of faith others who stoutly venture in the dark their human confidence the leader which they mistake for faith some whose hope totters upon crutches others who stalk into futurity upon stilts faith is not an exotic that grows in but one clime the snows of an eternal winter cannot quench its fire neither can the glow of a tropical sun destroy its life and freshness in the palace of the king or the hut of the peasant in the homes of the rich or the cabins of the poor it emits its fragrance with equal powers to please it is as necessary to the learned as to the ignorant and comforts alike the declining years of the sage and whom who never knew the value of education as the flower is before the fruit so is faith before good works he who has strong faith will show his faith by his works if he has faith in himself he shows it by ambitious plans resolves and endeavors a true faith is necessary to enable us to make the most of life and its possibilities we need a faith in our fellow men in all the ordinary business transactions we must exercise this virtue or accomplish nothing did you ever reflect what this world would be were all faith destroyed faith and confidence are synonymous terms what a wilderness would this be were the confidence which exists between husband and wife destroyed or did not mutual confidence exist between the members of the same family circle home would cease to be home family ties would prove to be bonds of straw communities could not be held together the vast fabric of society would dissolve and smiling countries would once more be the abode of savages too great a confidence bespeaks a trusting simplicity suited only for childish years but an utterly incredulous nature refusing to believe unless supported by the evidence of his own senses as certainly portrays the selfish narrow and bigoted nature as that fields of waving grain are proof positive of fertile soil the shining sun and the early and later rain in the section ninety four section ninety five of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by larry wilson the golden gems of life by emory adams allen and s c ferguson section ninety five worship prayer is the key to open the day and the bolt to shut in the night but as the sky drops the early dew and the evening dew upon the grass yet it would not spring and grow green by that constant and double falling of the dew unless some great shower at certain seasons did supply the rest so the customary devotion of prayer twice a day is the falling of the early and the latter dew but if you will increase and flourish in works of grace empty the great clouds sometimes and let it fall in full shower of prayer choose out seasons when prayer shall overflow like jordan in times of harvest real inward devotion knows no prayer but that arising from the depths of its own feeling perfect prayer without a spot or blemish though not a word be spoken and no phrases known to mankind be uttered 
always plucks the heart out of the earth and moves it softly like a censer to and fro beneath the face of heaven a good man's prayer will from the deepest dungeon climb heaven's height and bring a blessing down prayer is the wing wherewith the soul flies to heaven and meditation the eye wherewith we see god he that acts towards men as if god saw him and prays to god as if men heard him although he may not obtain all that he asks or succeed in all that he undertakes will most probably deserve to do so for with respect to his actions toward men however much he may fail with regard to others yet if pure and good with regard to himself and his highest interests they cannot fail and with respect to his prayers to god though they cannot make the deity more willing to give yet they will and must make the suppliant more worthy to receive between the humble and contrite heart and the majesty of heaven there are no barriers the only password is prayer prayer is a shield to the sword a sacrifice to god and a scourge to satan prayer has the right to the word ineffable it is an hour of outpouring which words cannot express of that interior speech which we do not articulate even when we employ it the very cry of distress is an involuntary appeal to that invisible power whose aid the soul invokes our prayer and god's mercy are like two buckets in a well while one ascends the other descends for the most part we should pray rather in aspiration than petition rather by hoping than requesting in which spirit also we may breathe a devout wish for a blessing on others upon occasion when it might be presumptuous to beg it prayer is not eloquence but earnestness not the definition of helplessness but the feeling it not figures of speech but compunction of soul when the heart is full when bitter thoughts come crowding thickly up for utterance and the poor common words of courtesy are such a very mockery how much the bursting heart may relieve itself in prayer the dullest observer must be sensible of the order and serenity prevalent in those households where the occasional exercise of a beautiful form of worship in the morning gives as it were the keynote to every temper for the day and attunes every spirit to harmony family worship embodies a hallowing influence that pleads for its observance it must needs be that trials will enter a household the conflict of wishes the clashing of views and a thousand other causes will ruffle the temper and produce jar and friction in the machinery of the family there is needed some daily agency that shall softly enfold the homestead with its hallowed soothing power and restore the fine harmonious play of its various parts the father needs that which shall gently lift away from his thoughts the disquieting burden of his daily business the mother which will smooth down the fretting irritation of her unceasing toil and trial and the child and domestic that which shall neutralize countless agencies of evil that ever beset them and what so well adapted to do this as when the day is done to gather round the holy page and pour a united supplication and acknowledgment to that sleepless power whose protection and security are ever around their path and who will bring all things at last into judgment and when darker and sadder days begin to shadow the home what can cheer and brighten the sinking heart so finely as this daily resort to the fatherly one who can make the tears of the lowliest sorrow to be the seed pearls of the brightest crown the mind is thus expanded the heart softened sentiments refined passions subdued hopes elevated and pursuits ennobled the greatest want of our intellectual and moral nature is here met and home education becomes impregnated with the spirit and elements of our preparation for eternity the custom of having family prayers is held in honor wherever there is real christian life and it is the one thing which more than any other knits together the loose threads of a home and unites its various members before god the religious service in which parents children and friends daily join in praise and prayer is at once an acknowledgment of dependence on the heavenly father and a renewal of consecration to his work in the world the bible is read 
uh, the hymn is sung the petition is offered and unless all else has been done as a mere formality and without hearty assent those who have gathered at the family altar leave it helped soothed strengthened and armored as they were not before they met there the sick and the absent are remembered the tempted and the tried are commended to god and as the israelites in the desert were attended by the pillar and cloud so in life's wilderness the family who inquire of the lord are constantly overshadowed by his presence and love we ignorant of ourselves may ask in prayer for what would be to our injury which the father denies as for our own good so find we profit by losing of our prayers or we may even pray for trifles without so much as a thought of the greatest blessing and with sorrow be it said we are not ashamed many times to ask god for that which we should blush to own to our neighbors it is by reason of the worthlessness of so many of our petitions that they remain unanswered good prayers never come creeping home we are sure we shall receive either what we ask or what we should ask prayer is a study of truth a sally of the soul into the infinite no man ever prayed heartily without learning something it is for the sake of man not of god that worship and prayer are required not that god may be rendered more gracious but that man may be made better that he may be confirmed in a proper sense of his dependent state and acquire those pious and virtuous dispositions in which his highest improvement consists when we pray for any virtues we should cultivate the virtue as well as pray for it the form of your life every petition to god is a precept to man our thoughts like the waters of the sea when exalted toward heaven lose all their bitterness and saltness and sweeten into an amiable humanity until they descend in gentle showers of love and kindness upon our fellow men god respecteth not the arithmetic of our prayers how many they are nor the rhetoric of our prayers how neat they are nor the geometry of our prayers how long they are nor the music prayers how melodious they are nor the logic prayers how methodical they are but the divinity of our prayers how heart-sprung they are not gifts but graces prevail in prayer we should pray with as much earnestness as those who expect everything from god and act with as much energy as those who expect everything from themselves it is possible to have a daily worship which shall be earnest vivifying tender and reverential and yet a weariness to nobody only let the one who conducts it mean toward the father the sweet obedience of the grateful child and maintain the attitude of one who goes about earthly affairs with a soul looking beyond and above them to the rest that remaineth in heaven it is not every one who is able to pray in the hearing of others with ease the timid tongue falters and the thoughts struggle in vain for utterance but who is there who cannot read a psalm or chapter or a cluster of verses and kneeling repeat in accents of tender trust the lord's prayer when we think of it that includes everything end of section ninety five section ninety six of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Golden Gems of Life by Emory Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 96. Religion. Religion is the moral link that binds man most closely with his God, the spiritual garden where the creature walks in companionship with his Maker this sentiment is the highest that man is capable of cherishing since it binds him to a being fitted as no other being is to impart to the soul the highest moral grandeur that created beings can enjoy it is the upper window of the soul which opens into the clear radiant light of god's eternal home its influence in every department of the mind is salutary and holy 
no faculty can rise to its most exalted state without the sanctifying power of this sentiment neglect it not the highest beauties of your souls the finishing touch of your character the sweetest charm of your life will be given by due attention to this your first and last duty if men have been termed pilgrims and life a journey then we may add that the christian pilgrimage far surpasses all others in the following important particulars in the goodness of the road in the beauty of the prospect in the excellence of the company and in the rich rewards waiting the traveller at the journey's end all who have been great and good without christianity would have been much greater and better with it true religion is the poetry of the heart it has enchantment useful to our manners it gives us both happiness and virtue true religion hath in it nothing weak nothing sad nothing constrained it enlarges the heart is simple free and attractive it enables us to bear the sorrows of life and it lessens the pangs of death it is the coronet by token of which god makes you a princess in his family and an heir to his brightest glories the sweetest pleasures the noblest privileges and the brightest honors of his kingdom it is a star which beams the brighter in heaven the darker on earth grows the night when the rising sun shed its rays on memon's statue it awakened music in the heart of stone religion does the same with nature without religion you are a wandering star you are a voiceless bird you are a motionless brook the strings of your heart are not in tune with the chords which the infinite hand sweeps as he evolves the music of the universe your being does not respond to the touch of providence and if beauty and truth and goodness come down to you like angels out of heaven and sing you their sweetest songs you do not see their wings nor recognize their home and parentage true religion and virtue give a cheerful and happy turn to the mind admit of all real joys and even procure for us the highest pleasures while it seems to have no other object than the felicity of another life it constitutes the chief happiness of the present there are no principles but those of religion to be depended upon in cases of real distress and these are able to encounter the worst emergencies and to bear us up under all the changes and chances to which our life is subject the difficulties of life teaches wisdom its vainglories humility its calumnies pity its hopes resignation its sufferings charity its afflictions fortitude its necessities prudence its brevity the value of time and its dangers and uncertainties a constant dependence upon a higher and all-protecting power all natural results are spontaneous the diamond sparkles without effort and the flowers open naturally beneath the summer rain religion is also a natural thing as spontaneous as it is to weep to love or to rejoice there is not a heart but has its moments of longing yearning for something better nobler holier than it knows now this bespeaks the religious aspiration of every heart genius without religion is only a lamp on the outer gate of a palace it may serve to cast a gleam of light on those that are without while the inhabitant sits in darkness religion is not proved and established by logic it is of all the mysteries of nature and the human mind the most mysterious and most inexplicable it is of instinct and not of reason it is a matter of feeling and not of opinion religion is placing the soul in harmony with god and his laws god is the perfect supreme soul and your souls are made in the image of his and like all created things are subject to certain mutable laws the transgression of these laws damages your souls warps them stunts their growth outrages them you can only be manly or attain to a manly growth by preserving your true relations and strict obedience to the laws of your being god has given you appetites and he meant that they should be to you a source of happiness but always in a way which shall not interfere with your spiritual growth and development he gave you desires for earthly happiness he planted in you the love of human praise enjoyment of society the faculty of finding happiness in all of his works 
he gave you his works to enjoy but you can only enjoy them truly when you regard them as blessings from the great giver to feed and not starve your higher nature there is not a true joy in life which you are required to deprive yourself of in being faithful to him and his laws without obedience to law your soul cannot be healthful and it is only to a healthful soul that pleasure comes with its natural its divine aroma some well-meaning christians tremble for their salvation because they have never gone through the valley of tears and of sorrow which they have been taught to consider as an ordeal that must be passed through before they can arrive at regeneration we can but think that such souls mistake the nature of religion the slightest sorrow for sins is sufficient if it produces amendment but the greatest is insufficient if it do not by their own fruits let them prove themselves for some soils will take the good seed without being watered by tears or harrowed up by afflictions there are three modes of bearing the ills of life by indifference which is the most common by philosophy which is the most ostentatious and by religion which is the most effectual it has been said philosophy readily triumphs over past or future evils but that present evils triumph over philosophy philosophy is a goddess whose head is indeed in heaven but whose feet are upon earth attempts more than she accomplishes and promises more than she performs she can teach us to hear of the calamities of others with magnanimity but it is religion only that can teach us to bear our own with resignation whoever thinks of life as something that could exist in its best form without religion is in ignorance of both life and religion is one or neither is anything religion is the good to which all things tend which gives to life all its importance to eternity all its glory apart from religion man is a shadow his very existence a riddle and the stupendous scenes around him as incoherent and unmeaning as the leaves which the sibyl scattered in the wind we are surrounded by motives to religion and devotion if we but mind them the poor are designed to excite our liberality the miserable our pity the sick our assistance the ignorant our instruction those that are fallen our helping hand and those who are vain we see the vanity of the world and those who are wicked our own frailty when we see good men rewarded it confirms our hopes when evil men are punished it excites our fears he that grows old without religious hopes as he declines into age and feels pains and sorrows incessantly crowding him falls into a gulf of misery in which every reflection must plague him deeper and deeper it is the property of the religious spirit to be the most refining of all influences it has been termed the social religion and society is as properly the sphere of all its duties privileges and enjoyments as the ecliptic is the course of the earth no external advantage no culture of the tastes no habit of command no association with the elegant or even depths of affection can bestow that delicacy and that grandeur of bearing which belong only to the mind which has experienced the discipline of religious thought and feeling all else all superficial aids to etiquette manner and refinement as expressed in look and gesture is but as guilt and cosmetic your personal value depends entirely upon your possession of religion you are worth to yourself what you are capable of enjoying you are worth to society the happiness you are capable of imparting a man whose aims are low whose motives are selfish who has in his heart no adoration of god whose will is not subordinate to the supreme will who has no hope no tenable faith in a happy immortality no strong arm trust that with this soul it shall be well in all the future cannot be worth very much to himself neither can such a man be worth very much to society because he has not that to bestow which society most needs for its prosperity and happiness christianity teaches the beauty and dignity of common and private life it makes it valuable not for the cares from which it frees us but for the constant duties through which we may train the soul to perfect sympathy with the design of the creator it shows that the humblest lot possesses opportunities 
which require the energies of the most exalted virtues to meet and satisfy it impresses upon us the solemn truth that life itself however humble its condition is always holy that every moment has its duty and its responsibility which christian strength alone the crown of power can do and bear it teaches us that the simplest experience may become radiant with a heavenly beauty when hallowed by a spirit of constant love to god and man another of the lessons of christianity is that of the inestimable worth of common duties as manifesting the great principles it bids us to attain perfection not striving to do dazzling deeds but by making our experience divine it shows us that the christian hero will ennoble the humblest field of labor that nothing is mean which can be performed as a duty but that religion like the touch of midas converts the humblest call of duty into spiritual gold in the section ninety six section ninety seven of the golden gems of life this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. The Golden Gems of Life by Emory Adams Allen and S. C. Ferguson. Section 97. God in Nature. The day is thine, the night is also thine. Thou hast prepared the light and the sun. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. Thou hast made summer and winter. Psalms The height of the heavens should remind us of the infinite distance between us and God, the brightness of the firmament of His glory, majesty and holiness, the vastness of the heavens and their influence upon the earth, of His immensity and universal providence. Hill and valley, seas and constellations are but stereotypes of divine ideas, appealing to and answered by the living soul of man. The works of nature and the works of revelation display religion to mankind in characters so large and visible that those who are not quite blind may see in them and read the first principles and most necessary parts of religion, and from thence penetrate into those infinite depths filled with the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. God writes the gospel not in the Bible alone, but on trees and flowers and clouds and stars. All nature, in short, speaks in language plain to be understood of the majesty and power of its author. Nature is man's religious book, with lessons for every day. Nature is the chart of God marking out all his attributes. A man finds in the production of nature an inexhaustible stock of materials upon which he can employ himself without any temptation to envy or malevolence and has always a certain prospect of discovering new reasons for adoring the sovereign author of the universe what profusion is there in his work when trees blossom there is not simply one but a whole collection of gems and leaves they have so many that they can throw them away to the winds all summer long what unnumbered cathedrals has he reared in the forest shades vast and grand, full of curious carvings, and haunted evermore by tremulous music. And in the heavens above, how do stars seem to have flown out of his hand, faster than sparks out of a mighty forge? These insignia of wisdom and power are impressed upon the works of God, which distinguishes them from the feeble imitation of men. Not only the splendor of the sun, but the glimmering light of the glowworm proclaim his glory god has placed nature by the side of man as a friend who remains always to guide and console him in life as a protecting genius who conducts him as well as all species to a harmonious unity with himself the earth is the material bosom which bears all the races nature arouses man from the sleep in which he would remain without thought of himself inspires him with noble designs and preserves thus in humanity activity in life the best of all books is the book of nature it is full of variety interest novelty and instruction it is ever open before us it invites us to read and all that it requires of us is the will to do it 
with eyes to see with ears to hear with hearts and souls to feel and with minds and understandings to comprehend infinite intelligence was required to compose this mighty volume which never fails to impart the highest wisdom to those who pursue it attentively and rightly with willing hearts and humble minds nature has perfection in order to show that she is the image of god and defects in order to show that she is only his image the study of nature must ever lead to true religion hence let there be no fear that the issues of natural science shall be skepticism or anarchy through all god's work there runs a beautiful harmony the remotest truth in his universe is linked to that which lies nearest the throne it has been said that an undevout astronomer is mad with still greater force might it be said that he who attentively studies nature and fails to see in her ways the workings of providence must indeed be blind who the guide of nature but only the god of nature in him we live move and have our being those things which nature is said to do are by divine art performed using nature as an instrument nor is there any such divine knowledge working in nature herself but in the guide of nature's work examine what department of nature that we will we are speedily convinced of an intelligent plan running throughout all the works which eloquently proclaims a divine author in the rock-ribbed strata of the earth we can read as intelligently as though it were written on parchment the story of the creation and what so interesting as this rock-written history to the world slowly fitting for mankind read of the coal stored away for future use of whole continents ploughed by glaciers and made fertile for man think of the eons of ages that this earth swung in space all the types of creation prophesying of the coming of man who can ponder these or without coming to the belief of an author and finisher of all this glory thus does a devout study of nature discover to us the god of nature go stand upon the heights at niagara and listen in awestruck silence to the boldest most earnest and most eloquent of all nature's oracles and what is niagara with its plunging waters and its mighty roar but the oracle of god the whisper of his voice is revealed in the bible as sitting above the water floods forever or view the stupendous scenery of alpine countries and there amid rock and snow overlooking the valleys below we feel a sense of the presence of divinity or wandering on ocean beach watching the play of the waves or listening to the roar of the breakers our hearts are impressed with a sense of the power and majesty of god in short wherever we contemplate the vast or wonderful in nature there we experience a religious exaltation of spirit it is the soul within us placing itself en rapport with the soul of nature the great first cause go stand upon the areopagus of athens where paul stood so long ago in thoughtful silence look around upon the sight of all that ancient greatness look upward to those still glorious skies of greece and what conceptions of wisdom and power will all those memorable scenes of nature and art convey to your mind now more than they did to an ancient worshipper of jupiter and apollo they will tell you of him who made the worlds by whom through whom and for whom are all things to you that landscape of exceeding beauty so rich in the monuments of departed genius with its distant classic mountains its deep blue sea and its bright bending skies will be telling a tale of glory that the grecian never learned for it will speak to you no more of its thousand contending deities but of the one living and everlasting god end of section ninety seven